to connect to a church, a home church, that we could be a part of in the community. And so Kim had met some friends at a mops group, and they invite us to Christmas Rock and Eat. My friend had told, told us that the music was really contemporary and it was, yeah, rocking, and that there was a lot of music. And we just thought that would be a great opportunity to bring our kids to church with us and, and just to, for all of us to sing together and sing praise to God. And, and since then, we've been coming ever since and become more and more part of what's going on at Crosswalk. Because don't be afraid. Uh, your friends, uh, people you know, because once you're here, you're, you're made to feel like family. All right, so just that encouragement again to, to share with those in the next week and uh, see where the Lord takes it. Now, if, if you would, you can get out your message notes, the crosswalk notes, and, and we will begin. We've been going through uh, Home for Christmas is the theme of our message, and, and we've been looking with our theme that they've all been movie titles of, of some older movies that have Christmas themes. And today we're going to be looking at, at part of one, the classic, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And the thing about it, the, the movie It's a Wonderful Life, a, a lot of the movie is about it not being necessarily a wonderful life, it being a stressful life. And, and so, in, I want you to fill out the first blank. We're going to look at a movie clip in a moment, but do you know what the most stressful day of the year is? December 18th. You can write that in the blank. December 18th is the most stressful day of the year. More stressful than April 15th is December 18th. And when they interviewed, they interviewed people, and of course, somebody does these things, and they, 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 they ask them, what's the most stressful day of the year, and, and why? And December 18th, which happens to be tomorrow, uh, just so you know, tomorrow's going to be the most stressful day of the year for you, because it's when everyone goes, oh my goodness, Christmas is in a week, and I have all these things to get done. And so, I, you know, it makes me think I, I was putting off getting the Christmas presents. I, I wasn't thinking about what we were going to be eating. I wasn't thinking about all of these things. And for that reason, December 18th is when reality sets in. And, and so you're going to be very stressed out tomorrow. And now as you, you consider that with, with all of the things that are mounting, I'm going to show you a little clip from the movie It's a Wonderful Life to show part of the stress, this, this wasn't necessarily December 18th, but definitely what stress can look like in a person's life. George, what's wrong? Wrong everything, Troy. You call this a happy family. Why do we have to have all these kids? Dad, how do you spell frankincense? I don't know. If I ask your mother. Where are you going? Going up to see Zeus. You told me to ride a flea for tomorrow. I'm sure she'll be all right. The doctor said that she ought to be out of bed in time to have her Christmas dinner. Is that Zuzu's teacher? Yes. Let me see. Hello. Hello, Mrs. Welsh. Well, it's George Bailey. I'm Zuzu's father. Say, what kind of a teacher are you, anyway? What do you mean sending her home like that, half naked? You realize she'll probably end up with pneumonia on account of you? George. Is this the sort of thing we pay taxes for, to have, teacher, have teachers like you, stupid, silly, careless people that send our kids home without any clothes on? You know, maybe my kids aren't the best dressed kids, and maybe they don't have any decent clothes. Oh, that's stupid. Hey, hello, Mrs. People. Welch. I, I want to apologize. Hello? Hello? She's hung up. I'll hang her up. Hey, you. I'll knock you up tomorrow. What is it? Hello, who's this? Oh, Mr. Welch. Okay, that's fine, Mr. Welch. Give me a chance to tell you what I really think of your wife. George, Will you George. get out and let me handle this? Hello. Hello, what? Oh, you will, huh? Okay, Mr. Welch, anytime you think you're man enough, you... Hello. Any... Uh... Dad, how do you spell hallelujah? How should I know? What do you think I am, a dictionary? Tommy, stop that, stop it. 
Janie, haven't you learned that silly tune yet? You play it over and over again. Now stop it, stop it. Sorry, Mary. Janie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I, you go on and practice. Oh, Pete, I owe you an apology, too. No, I'm sorry. What do you want to know? Nothing, Daddy. What's the matter with everybody? Janie, go on. I told you to practice. Now go on, play. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> George, why must you torture the children? Why don't you? Mary. All right, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and how to set up a message about being a wonderful life, right? And I think maybe as we look at that, I just love that clip because in that short period of time, it kind of captures what Christmas can be like. Maybe your stories are a little bit different, but when you get everyone together, there's all it takes is one little thing, and, and it, everything else, it's like a house of cards just falls apart where we're mad at everyone. And then what is Christmas without an outburst, right? Uh, where someone just loses it, has a, men a, a, a breakdown, whether it be one of the kids, one of the parents, and then once it's over, just sitting there going, oh my goodness, what just happened? And, and, and then you, you stand there wondering what just happened. And I think it's important that, that we look at a clip like this so that, first of all, it, it's, it, what I like about it is we can look at that and laugh. And, and we laugh a little bit because of its, its reality. We know it's not necessarily true. But what is happening, we can relate to on, on one level or another. And so let's look at some of these things, that, the fill-ins. And, and, and a lot of this had to do with George Bailey in this movie. If you were to watch the whole movie, it has to do with him feeling like a failure. George Bailey, what he really wanted to do is get away from Bedward, Bedford Falls. That's all he wanted to do. He wanted to make it big. He wanted to go out and, and, and go out to a big city and make it big somewhere. And the whole movie was about him being drawn back into this small town. And, and every time that, that he had the opportunity to leave, someone else took that opportunity or, or he had to stay behind. And so as we look at this, maybe some of the things we can relate to, and it, it can help us understand why tomorrow, December 18th, is, is going to be stressful, and maybe identify some of these things. So the first one, am I failing in my role as a parent? And there you could really put family members. I know some of you aren't, aren't parents, but, but maybe it might be as a child. Maybe it might be as a spouse or whatever it is. And in this, we really didn't go into it too much, but he had one of his kids. One of his kids had gotten really sick and, and was in bed, and, and they were worried about her. And when you have a sick child in the house, you know this stress. And then as you start to think about it, whose fault is it? You know, what did we do? How did we fail as a parent? And so he went a, a, a much better route, and that is blaming the teacher, my goodness. Um, absolutely. And, and, but either way, that, that you have these failures that you see with family. Maybe some of you are feeling like a failure in family because your kids or people you love and care about aren't going to be here. Or, or maybe, sometimes even worse, is they are going to be here but you know down deep they wish they weren't, 
or, or that it's going to cause so much stress with them being here because of issues that are going on, and now we get Christmas as the opportunity where these things are, are going to come to the surface uh, sometime soon. The next one is, am I failing my role as a friend? Very similar with, with, when you look at friends and, and family. But, but with George Bailey, it was as really a member of the community, uh, the larger community of friends and the people that he knew around him, that, that these people with his, his building and loan, that, that the business was going down and this would be a failure to them as well. How is he going to answer them? How is he going to respond to them? The next one, am I failing in my line of work? In my line of work. And now with, with the work, it, it has to do with, with what the plans I have. And, and so some of you this time of year uh, have the end of, end of year. And so as you are looking at the numbers where you're going, oh my goodness, are, are, how are we going to do? Uh, maybe some of you don't have it until the end of June. So, so this is a little bit of a, a mid-season where you look at the numbers and you say, how are we doing? Am I going to be able to continue this? Or as you look at the amount of money that you can or can't spend on Christmas gifts, that that's a reminder of the work where we just, we just don't have the type of money to go to, to Disneyland over Christmas. We don't have the type of money to get you one of these drones that has the camera on it that can fly all over the place like your friend gets. We, we, we don't have that type of money, and Christmas is a reminder of that, of our limited resources. And then finally, am I failing in the pursuit of my dreams? In the pursuit of my dreams. See, it's a little hard for me because I... I don't have Facebook because I don't think it's catching on. I think it's going to be, it's, gonna, it's just not going to catch on, so I don't have Facebook. But what I do is, is I write a Christmas letter each year. And then for your Christmas letter, I go through the stress once a year that you go through every day when you have Facebook. And that is, how do I make my life sound exciting? At least for me, I have a whole year to, to pick from. So I'm able to go back and say, what exciting happened in the last 12 months that I can put on this, this piece of paper? And, and that's when you can come to this realization, am I doing what I want to do? Am I, all these dreams about where I was going with my life, is this, is this happening? And it's something about throwing December 25th along with January 1st as you look back at the past year and say, what did I do in the past year besides get another year older? All of these things have to do with not having a wonderful life. And that's the next fill-in. My life seems far from wonderful. And if you feel this way at all, and, and, and it, or if you just feel this way at times, I think you can relate to the message from Isaiah chapter 40. Because where we are going is we're going back to, to God's people, the, the people of Israel. And they had all of these promises from God and all of these dreams. These were the people that were the descendants of King David, the, the descendants of King Solomon. And, and so you have this greatness that was the, the empire of Israel that at this point now had over the years and, and over the decades slowly shrunk to a point where... They were just about at a point where they were no longer going to be a people at all. And Isaiah chapter 1 through Isaiah chapter 40 was God telling them why this happened. God was connecting the dots for them to say, because of your sin, because of all of these things that have happened over the past, this is where it, it has led you, and this is where you are. And so all of these relationships, all of the dreams they would have had as a people were now slowly falling in and, and imploding on top of them. That was Isaiah chapter 1. Through 39. So imagine 39 chapters, roughly, of God coming to them and simply pointing out all of the sins that they had committed and what was going to happen as a result. And it, and it was in this type of an environment that these words were spoken, and, and they are so shockingly different from the rest of the book. And this is what God says to his people. Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. 
Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. These words are, are so different. In the book of Isaiah, we, we have the book of Isaiah. If, if you look in, in the Bible, it's all one book. So it, it goes from chapter 1 all the way through 60-plus chapters. And, and it shows as one book. But for the people of Israel, these were actually two different books, that they had Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. And, and one of the reasons why they were divided is because their messages were so starkly different that, that it was finally time that, that when Isaiah came in chapter 40, that all of the promises that as bad as things have been gotten, as, as bad as the way that the people felt, and it was almost like God had to take them to the brink of despair so that they saw no hope in themselves and, and no place where this could go until finally they realized, oh my goodness, where can we go? This is all falling apart. There's only one place for us to look now in our despair, and that is up. And when they did, they looked up and they saw their God and the promises. And so what does he say? Comfort. Comfort my people. Let's fill in those blanks for quickly. In, in the midst of failure and holiday stress, God offers us, God offers you, number one, comfort. And let's fill them all in. The second one is kindness. He offers you rest. And he offers you forgiveness. During the, the holiday season when people get stressed, and I've been told that, that I do this occasionally, and when I get stressed out, I uh, get a little grumpy. That's, that's the word on the street. And, and so things are said, and not only it's what is said, but how it's said, that, that I've been accused of being a little short with people, that I just don't, uh, um, I don't choose my words wisely. And what I forget is how powerful they can be. That, that words are, are, your words are powerful, not only what you say, but how you say them. The problem with me is, I, I learned this from a kid, the, the time I stop is when I see tears or blood. That, that was the rule with my brothers. You wouldn't stop until that would tell me I have hurt him sufficiently. Now, that, that's the way that it worked, and I think we all do that. That we look and we think that our, if, if someone is either not crying or hurting in some outward way, I can keep going. And so words like, I hate you. I'm better off without you. Shut up. Leave me alone. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're pathetic. You are, you fill in the blank. What is it that you like to do for those around you? What do you say to knock them down? If you've ever been asked, why are you so mean? Why are you doing this to me? What's your problem? All of these are those indications. And, and so what follows them usually are those outbursts then where you finally had enough. If you want to know that I've had enough, I'll show you. And, and, and sometimes it's not crying or, or blood. It's yelling. It's demonstrations physically of how upset I am. And in the midst of this, notice what God says, is, is your words are, are powerful not only in upsetting people, but they're powerful in comforting people. I love you. And, and the, notice the comfort and the kindness are so close. To be able to, to, to talk to someone and, and come up and, and simply put your hand on them, not in anger, but in a calming way. Comfort my people. I, I have the picture of a, of a baby, of a mom holding a baby that's crying. And how does, how does she comfort the baby? It's okay. Just being reassuring. Telling her, it's okay, I'm here now. You don't have to be afraid. We're, we're good, just calm down. You can stop crying now. And I wonder if, if we need that more than we think. Not only on December 18th, but maybe on a, a daily basis. People telling us, it's, you know what, it's going to be all right. And this is what you have from God, and this is the message he's telling you today. It's the message that he's telling his people. As the coming of the Savior approaches, be comforted. 
here are kind things. And, and, and what do we have to say? What does God have to say? Rest. Your hard service is over. Who of us, this, I think this time of year, what most of us probably need is a nap. <laughs> that we just need some time to just lay down and rest and relax. It's not just spiritual, it's physical as well. And that's what the Lord offers us is, is, is rest and notice the forgiveness of sins. How many Christmases do you get together and remember old Christmases or are you reminded of past behaviors that, that bring it back up again? And, and it's a way that family kind of messes with each other. But God doesn't. God tells you you're forgiven. You know, all that past, those previous 40 chapters of Isaiah, they're gone. They are forgiven. We continue. So, so all of this is happening. He's speaking, comforting his people. Then he says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. So what he's picturing here is something that would happen, especially when a, a, an invading army and then the king would come is they would make a road. And the road is the way that they would be able to bring supplies back and forth. It's a way that they would be able to bring their troops back and forth. And it was also the way then that someone who was the king, as he came in his, uh, whether it be some type of cart or carriage or maybe even carried, that, that it would be level for him to be brought, brought forward. So in the blank you can write, I want to get rid of anything that gets in the way of God's entrance into my heart and life. And, and what I want you to think about is you're going to have opportunity to think about this if you live in Levine. And it's going to be every time you drive by where the 202 is going to be coming through. <laughs> Especially if you live west, west of it, newsflash, you're in jail. That, that, there is, that when you look at all the work, and it takes a long period of time, because the preparation isn't, isn't about just getting someone out there with some blacktop. It's, you, you look at all the work that's being done out by our house. I'm, I'm by basically 59th and South Mountain, so between Baseline and Dobbins. We go walking at night. We, we'll see the dogs, and there are semis all night long bringing the dirt. And they're only, they've only done it on half the side of baseline. Now it's going to have to be the other side because there's so much work to be done in order to, to make it happen. There's intersections and on-ramps and, and base work and, and all of those things that you don't even see once you're on it. And that's what it's like in our relationship with God. Because when God comes into your life, you know what it affects? Everything. Everything. It, it intersects all of these different, these things of your life that, that I've mentioned before. It, it intersects family. It intersects friendships. It, it intersects works. It, it, it intersects everything that I do. And, and now, how is this an on-ramp where, where Jesus can come in to my life and, and be a part of this and bring me that comfort and bring me that kindness on a daily basis? Because the problem that we have and the problem these people had is there, there was no access. Jesus didn't have access to their hearts. And what he's telling them is you need to, to give him access. And the two things that get in the way most often are arrogance, so pride, but then also the other one that, that's just as big is despair. That, that people are, are in, I don't, need, I don't need God's help, or God can't help me. It's too bad. And that's where Isaiah is saying it. And this was the message of John the Baptist, ultimately, who came with a message of repentance to the people, to say there is a problem, and the problem is you, and, and the way that we deal with this is in humility to confess our sins, to be honest with God, and recognize that with him is forgiveness. We turn the page. The last verses. The, this is the last verse of, of this reading from Isaiah 40. And so he says, When you prepare the way, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, 
and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Remember, they, they would prepare these roads so that the king would come. And now he's saying that as you prepare, as you make this straight, there, there's going to be, the king is going to be coming. And the way that this is described is with the terminology, the glory of the Lord. Now let's look at the next passage so we're clear we understand what we're talking about. And that's Exodus 24, verse 16. And it says, And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. So this is way back at the time of the children of Israel. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. So what you had back at the time of the children of Israel when they left Egypt was God appeared in a, a physical way. And what it was, was during the day it was a cloud, and at night it was a, a pillar of fire. And what would happen is they had the tabernacle, which was in, in the middle of where all the people camped, and the Lord would rest, uh, that, that this glory of the Lord would rest in the center of the camp, and, and the people would be able to see in a very real way, God is with us, God is leading us. And so sometimes the glory of the Lord would stay there a few months. Maybe, maybe it might even stay a year. And then one day... Glory of the Lord goes up and moves, and that's where the people say, you know what, time for us to leave. God is, God is directing us. We, there's no doubt about this. The glory of the Lord, that consuming fire, that God is with us and, and God is directing us. That is the promise in Isaiah, that, that Isaiah is saying, remember, remember the good old days when we had God lead us that way? It stopped when they came into the promised land. And now what he's saying is, we have drifted so far away from God, there is going to be a time when you see the glory of the Lord and his saving activity and his guidance again. And now notice the last words. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The promise of Isaiah being fulfilled in Bethlehem the night that Jesus was born, the glory of the Lord. God's saving activity so that you can see God with you is going to be there. And that's what they celebrated. That is what the angels celebrated. That's what the shepherds celebrate, and it's what we celebrate now. Because the way that we have the glory of the Lord with us is, not, is no longer the pillar of fire in a cloud, but it's in a person, Jesus Christ. And that is why we can have Christ with us at all times, and he is with us with his words and his promises. And not only that, but in a very real way that God is with us in our lives. In the blank, you can write, the glory of the Lord is a physical way that God shows his saving power among his people. And you can fill in the last one as well. My life is wonderful because Jesus came to the world to be with me. He still comforts me with his sure promises. Now I got to show you one more clip from the movie of uh, what it's like to have joy uh, and, and what it's like to be wonderful at Christmas time. Just a minute, just a minute. Quiet, everybody. Quiet, quiet. Now get this it's from London. Oh. Mr. Gower cabled you need cash. Stop. My office instructed to advance you up to $25,000. Stop. Oh. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas, Sam Wainwright. Oh.
because the fool flew all the way up here in a blizzard. Harry, how about your banquet in New York? Oh, I left right in the middle of it. As soon as I got Mary's telegram. Good idea, Ernie. A toast. <laughs> to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. <laughs> It's my favorite part of the movie. It's the good part. It's where I cry every time. <laughs> to my, my brother George, the richest man in town. And, and we look at this. This was a short period of time from the time that he was in despair the, to the time that he, he gets to the, the name of the movie. It's a wonderful life. And why is it wonderful? Because I am so wealthy in the promises that God has given me. That is what makes it wonderful, these promises from Isaiah, the comfort that God gives, the kindness that God gives us. It doesn't go away. The rest that he gives, the forgiveness. That is what Christmas is all about. And it's why our season, even December 18th, can be a wonderful day. And it's not just a wonderful time of year. It is a truly wonderful life. You, are, you live forgiven by Jesus Christ and loved by him. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you come and you do bring comfort and kindness at times when, quite honestly, we are hurting. In this room, Lord, I, I know there is pain, and I know that there is pain that the holidays make even worse. And a lot of it has to do with people that we love who either aren't here anymore or, or the pain that we have in, in dealing with relationships with people who are. But Lord, whatever the pain is here, please come with your comfort. Speak to each individual personally. Let them hear your words of comfort and kindness and, and know that they are loved by you and, and help them through the difficulty that they are going through today. Lord, we have one week till Christmas and a lot of things. Many of us have a lot of things that need to be done yet, and that's very real. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do it while at the same time keeping our eyes focused clearly on you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, just a reminder if.